in my talk, SRE is a fad. Um, I was going to make a joke about, we, we've got three hours for this, right? But since we're already, what, seven minutes in, I'm, we're going to do this the quick and dirty way, uh, go through all the slides, talk about things. We'll have plenty of time for questions, I think, right? We've got some time for questions. And then uh, anything that I didn't go into enough detail on or you know, made jumps to conclusions on, um, definitely call me out on those. I, I don't think any of you have, have uh, come to one of my talks before. Um, my talks generally are presenting a challenge based on my usually incomplete knowledge of the world. And then I like having people say, no, you're wrong. This is how it really should be. Um, and that's how we get better as an industry. Um, all right. so. I did call my talk SRE is a fad. Uh, as I was writing it, I realized I could have just as easily called it, uh, you're not ready for platform engineering yet, or you know, you know dev experience, yeah, developer experience is, is the work of evil, or something like that. You know, something equally thought provoking. So uh, hopefully we'll get to the root of some of those, those comments. Uh, all right, so what are we actually gonna talk about today? Uh, first, I will tell you a little bit about myself. I noticed that lots of conference talks uh, have slides about uh, this is who the person is and usually it has absolutely no relevance to why you should actually listen to them. But I'm going to tell you why you should listen to me or maybe not at all listen to me. Um, we'll do a brief history of SRE, a brief revisionist history of SRE based on you know, my experiences. We'll talk about, obviously, the title of the talk and then we'll talk about how we can fix it right? because we don't want anything to just be a fad into eternity. We actually, there are some valuable elements of SRE and we wanna talk about uh, how we can actually make use of them. All right, so let's talk about me a little bit. Um, the slides are gonna suck. I'm sorry, I am not good at PowerPoint. The only reason that this looks remotely presentable is because there's some new feature in PowerPoint called designer which I couldn't figure out how to use, but it seems to do a decent job, and I just then copied and pasted a bunch of slides, and hey, it works. It'll be a visual to go along with my rambling. Um, I'm a software engineer. I've been a software engineer my entire career. I'm not a site reliability engineer. I'm not a DevOps person, whatever that is. Uh, I've always been writing production code, uh, I, I haven't even been on the QA side officially ever, but I've been writing code for a lot of different companies, a lot of different products. I've been writing code. I write a lot of code, which is actually the next point. I write a lot of code. I've done a lot of side projects. I've done a lot of projects for large teams, small teams. Um, most of those small teams, obviously, you want some of the benefits that come with things that you might consider site reliability engineering. So I've thought a lot about these things, but from the perspective of a software engineer, which is actually not to give away something later in the talk, but that's kind of where site reliability engineering came from, right? Uh, I am employed. I, my day job is I work for a company called Resolve Systems. We do IT, operation, IT automation. Uh, we build a platform that allows people to automate their IT stuff. Um, and then my current side project is uh, going the direction of no-code business automation tools so that people don't have to write more code to solve the problems that they have. So that's, that's fun. That's cool. I get to write code so they don't have to. Um, uh, I've actually given versions of this talk couple other places before, but it's really, the, the concepts in this talk have matured uh, as I've talked about the things and learned more and gone through my career and, and that sort of thing. Um, so the first one I call, I think I called it holistic engineering. Um, basically the idea being that as software engineers, we, well, I, first of all, how many of you are software engineers? Okay, most of you. How many of you are site reliability engineers? One and a half people. Okay, cool. So SREs, hopefully I don't offend you. If I do, please call me out on my BS. Um, as software engineers, um, hopefully you'll, you'll learn something, something from this. Um, so, so holistic engineering, basically the premise of that talk was as software engineers, we are responsible. We are primarily tasked with writing a bunch of code that eventually deploys somewhere and customers can use it and, and whatnot. Um, 
but there's a lot of other stuff that goes into making it actually useful, deploying it, securing it, maintaining it, uh, testing it. There's you know, this huge process that depending on whether you're coming from the Agile perspective or the waterfall perspective, and there are plenty of other talks to be had on that. I'm not gonna get into that because we would be here for three hours. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on that's worth being mindful of. Even if you're not actively involved in doing all the bits and pieces, being completely ignorant of all the other stuff that goes into actually making software function and work and usable, um, that's a really important part of the, the whole process. So that, that's what that talk was about. Then I gave a talk that I called Zero DevOps, and this actually came out of, I was organizing a conference, uh, kind of similar to this one actually, but I lived in Colorado Springs for a while. We did a little conference that was only around for two years because I moved. I'm not there anymore, and no one else wanted to organize it. So, sorry. Sorry, Colorado Springs. That doesn't happen. This is a much more awesome conference. I'm glad to be here. This is, this is my first time here, and it's been 10 years since I realized this existed, and now I'm finally here, and it's, it's awesome. Um, so Zero DevOps came out of I was building the website for this, this conference, and being a software engineer with a bunch of side projects with very little time, and also I wanted to sleep. I didn't want to spend time doing DevOps. I didn't want to spend time deploying the site every time someone made a change, every time we you know, updated the schedule or something like that. I just wanted it to happen. Um, so the premise of that talk was basically, how can I spend the absolute bare minimum, ideally zero time, on DevOps? And I was calling it DevOps at the time. All right, none of that's crazy, so let's talk about uh, uh, SRE and let's get into a little bit of a kind of history of, of some terms, right? This, this whole thing that became SRE, became platform engineering, became DevOps, uh, is kind of the evolution of, of things that happen to deploy and maintain software, right? Deploying and maintaining software has been around since, well, software, right? Back in the day, you would write the software on the machine that it was running on because machines were the size of this room and there was only one of them, so that was your only option. Um, but as we got to like, you know, laptops and that sort of thing, it became really easy to have separate development environments and, and production environments and that sort of thing. And you needed a process to get from one place to the other. And that's kind of where, where DevOps came from, right? Initially, it was software engineers who were responsible for their, basically their own DevOps. And then as it became more and more specialized, uh, now we have uh, actual uh, DevOps departments. And how am I on time? The timer on, on this is way off. Okay, I'm, I'm great on time, yes. okay. So don't look at the clock on my computer, just look at my watch, I'm okay. Okay, so DevOps. Have we beaten the dead horse of DevOps enough? I think let's move on to SRE. All right, so SRE is kind of an evolution of DevOps in my mind, uh, where we start introducing scale, right? So DevOps applies to any company, you just need a place to deploy your code. But when you start getting into 24 seven uh, support or you know, at some number of nines of reliability, uh, now you start getting into, well, I just used the, the word reliability, right? We have to worry about reliability. Um, so site reliability engineering really came from Google. Uh, they kind of defined the term. Uh, and actually, if you read the, the, the Google SRE book that everybody refers to, um, they talk about they accomplished IT operations or uh, software reliability as a concept from the perspective of what would software engineers do? Because that's what they were. They were all software engineers. So it wasn't how do we tr approach this like a, an IT operations department would, would approach it. It's how would software engineers approach it. Um, so that's what they did. Uh, and they kind of defined this whole discipline uh, that's obviously more than just deployment, but also making sure that, that things stay up and, and around and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and now we, we have this term called platform engineering. And I feel like, well, DevOps, I've seen many, many companies define it way differently. I've seen companies call DevOps things that weren't even remotely DevOps. Like if they they talk to another company and said, here's how we do DevOps, they would be like, that's not DevOps, that's bug fixing. 
no joke, right? This is, this is how we address technical debt. Oh, that's what we do for our DevOps. No, it's not. That's not DevOps. DevOps is something t totally different. Anyway, SRE, I've seen people call SRE multiple different things. Platform engineering, I've certainly seen people call platform engineering multiple different things. Um, so I decided to go to the source of truth, the Google, right? I typed in to Google search, what is platform engineering? And the answer that I got was, platform engineering is the discipline of designing and building internal developer platforms, tool chains, and workflows that enable self-service capabilities for software engineering organizations. Now, I got to about here when I was reading this the first time, and the discipline of designing and building internal developer platforms. So wait a minute, you're telling me that we have an entire group of people responsible for building tools to solve problems that we created ourselves. <sighs> what are we doing? Okay, anyway, let's, let's try a different source of truth. Well, let's try ChatGPT, right? What could possibly go wrong? Platform engineering refers to the practice of designing, building, and maintaining the underlying infrastructure and systems that enable software applications and services to run efficiently and reliably. I'm actually okay with that definition. That's not terrible. Um, and the reason I'm okay with that is it, it doesn't uh, call out specifically, hey, we're building a bunch of extra tools that, are, that kind of live in your own little world. Um, it actually suggests potentially some collaboration, and I really like that. Uh, collaboration, knowledge sharing, breaking down silos. Um, but it does sound a lot like SRE. So what's, what's going on? Um, in my mind, uh, SREs is kind of, I'm actually gonna read from my notes here because I wanna make sure I get it right. A set of goals for how the software and its infrastructure should be monitored and operated, and platform engineering further formalizes that into an approach, uh, building a platform that's custom tailored to the type of, en uh, type of software components that software engineers are writing. Um, so if you wanna, tie it to kind of a concrete example. Uh, I think of DevOps like the Docker image, right? This is how we deploy software. SRE might be the Kubernetes cluster, how we actually get it out in, into production, monitor it, and tie it in with other components, that sort of thing, that's cool. And then platform engineering would be like the set of scripts that, that software engineers would use so they don't have to think about Kubernetes. Um, now, you might say, you know, I don't know what Kubernetes is, and I like it that way. Well, I do too. I can't, I don't understand Kubernetes. I have tried countless times, and I still don't understand how Kubernetes is supposed to work and how it's supposed to solve my, my problems. But that doesn't mean I don't want to know, right? I, I want to know how my software is getting deployed. I want to know how it ties in with the other services that it, that it works with. Even if I can't wrap my head around the actual commands to run to get a Kubernetes thing to work and why I need 15,000 YAML files just for one stinking service, I still want to be aware of, of how that's all going to work and work with the people who do, right? I, I want to break down those silos. Um, yeah, which is really kind of the heart of this talk. Um, in an effort to break down silos, we just end up creating more. Right? The whole premise of DevOps and the whole premise of SRE and the whole premise of platform engineering was there are additional complexities that are introduced by things like, hey, our dev environment and our deployment environment are two separate environments. Uh, we need to scale. Um, we're using more and more complex tools in order to do that and, and there's kind of a knowledge gap. Well, that's fine, but the way to get past that is not to further create silos, right? We don't create another department that their sole responsibility is these things. We want, we want to spread that knowledge so that um, we don't get into trouble, right? Okay, so specific shortfalls. I'm just gonna go through that. Just expand that slide. Um, it's education, tooling, and incentives, right? Uh, education, there's just a knowledge gap between software engineers and the, all the other disciplines, right? I, it's frustrating how many software engineers I've run into who haven't had some form of uh, yeah. secure applications or secure 
training, secure development training or something like that. Even, you know, how many of you have heard of uh, OWASP? Okay, good, that's fantastic. Um, that was, the camera can't see it, but most people raise their hand, right? Uh, if you haven't heard of OWASP, O-W-A-S-P, go look it up, your future selves will thank you. Um, but those sorts of things, like simple things that uh, should just kind of be part of software development, software engineering culture, software engineering mindset. Because um, security, which is what that's all about, is really hard to build in after the fact. If you approach software engineering from a secure perspective, it's a lot easier to write secure code than if you write code and then try to make it secure later on. And that's just one example. Uh, tooling, obviously, I feel like every, that was not a sentence. Not obviously, but I feel like every day there's a new tool that appears on the scene that is supposed to be the silver bullet to make software engineering work absolutely fabulously. That's not the case, but some percentage of companies, some percentage of software engineers are going to start using those tools uh, and there's just no way to keep pace with that, right? And then incentives. Um, how many of you spend an actual measurable amount of time fixing technical debt? That's not how that question was supposed to go. That's two thirds of the audience? Um, that's fantastic. Um, typically, especially now, right, with the economic crunch, um, it's really hard to justify things that aren't directly delivering value to customers. Things that aren't going to directly make money for the company, it's kind of hard to justify. And depending on you know, the, the people who aren't software engineers and, and typically can't be, like you know, product managers, program managers, C-levels, right? Um, if they recognize the value of technical debt, you'll work on technical debt. If they're really focused on all the other stuff, it's really hard to justify technical debt. Um, if, you, if you don't have that kind of advocacy, it can be, it can be hard. And that's just one example. Um, right, operations is another example. Um, depending on your organization, you might have some time to uh, you know, make sure the application is running as well as it could be. Uh, if you don't, you're just fixing bugs and if it breaks, you figure out why and you're kind of in this ad hoc, ad hoc um, situation. But that's, that's, a, that's a struggle, right? This is, this is something where uh, it really pulls away from how do we uh, bridge these knowledge gaps, break down these silos and uh, get to a place where SRE isn't someone else's responsibility. It's something that we, we have as part of our, our culture. All right, so why is SRE a fad? I, I pretty much already said it. Um, we keep creating these silos. Um, yeah, just making sure I didn't already say everything that's in my notes. And yeah, that's, I did. So cool, we're ahead of schedule. All right, so what's the solution? Uh, it's basically just changing the culture. Hey, just minor details, change the entire culture of your company. No big deal, it, it'll be easy, you can do it tomorrow. Right, today, Sunday, tomorrow's Monday? Yeah, by the end of tomorrow, the culture at your company will be completely changed. You won't need an SRE department anymore. I'm kidding, this is, this is gonna take a while. Um, but it really is that foundational. It is a cultural mindset. Uh, so even if you have a DevOps department, even if you have an SRE department, even if you have a platform engineering team department, whatever, um, that doesn't mean that you can't break down these silos because it's all about the silo. It's all about the knowledge gap and that sort of thing. Um, so, and I'd say start with the beginning. Start with DevOps and learn how your software is being deployed uh, and learn all the implications that that process has for uh, the code that you're writing. You know, make sure you don't get the, the whole process into trouble and, and cause other issues there. And then once you have that as part of your, your culture, start moving into the SRE uh, area. So uh, how do we make sure that, that the software stays running? Uh, how do we fix things when the software goes down, when the you know, uh, service explodes? Large, big, bad errors, that sort of thing. Um, how, do we, how do we get past it? And then from there, you could get into platform engineering. But in my 
idea of my vision of this, it wouldn't be a platform engineering team that's writing all these scripts to enable software engineers. It would be software engineers writing scripts to enable their future selves or to enable their peers, right? If a software engineer builds a feature and there's a script that goes with it that helps it along, that, that allows other people to make use of it later on, configure it on their dev machines, whatever, write that script, write that documentation, write that Docker image of database configuration, whatever it is, um, you know, don't don't force that onto some other team that inevitably doesn't have all the knowledge that you have because you built the feature. All right, and that's apparently there were bullet points that went along with that. See, I'm not good at PowerPoint. I'm, but give me a topic to talk about. I'll talk about it for way longer than we have. All right. Specific tactics. Uh, this slide should look familiar. It's the same three things I called out earlier. Education, tooling, and come on, incentive. Right? So fix those knowledge gaps. Cross-train each other. Learn all the stuff that the DevOps folks are working on. Learn all the stuff, uh, all the things my grammar has left the building. Learn all the things that SRE is, is responsible for. Uh, and then uh, platform engineering as well. Learn some Go if you really want to. I don't want to, but you might want to. Um, tooling, I don't know how you keep, keep pace with all the tools that are out there, but maybe some of them, maybe the ones that your organization uses. Um, and then incentives. This is, this is more of a conversation, right? If you're not working on technical debt, well, maybe I don't talk about that because most of you are working on technical debt. Um, but if you're not working on technical debt, start thinking critically about why technical debt is important. What other things is preventing you from doing by not having worked on that, that previous technical debt? Technical debt is an interesting one because technical debt, there is a floor. So anytime you write code, you are always piling more and more technical debt. You can always whittle that down if you focus on it, but eventually you're only going to get to that floor. You can't have negative technical debt. I wish you could because then you would set yourself up so well that you would almost, you could, you could get yourself to a place where you would get back to zero technical debt, but not past zero technical debt. I wish that were the case, but you, you can't. So anytime you're not focusing on technical debt, technical debt is accumulating and you're just making it harder for your future self. So think about these things. And somehow I ended on time, even though we started way late. Sorry, I, <laughs> hopefully we can make up for that with questions. Um, this is some information about me. I also have a YouTube channel <clears throat> called Dev Parkour. I meant to update this slide and it completely slip, slipped my mind. But yeah, I don't do the social media stuff. I just have an email address and a GitHub page. You can find me. Um, if you're in the area and part of Bellingham Codes, I'm also on that Slack organization. Workspace, whatever they call it. Um, unless I'm on LinkedIn. But yeah, at this point, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. And in, up to and including you telling me that my talk was completely wrong and here's why. I'm afraid I'm going to turn this into a rambling question, so I'll try really hard to focus it. <laughs> um, I, my, the root question I'm going to ask is about team composition. So sure, not de not de-siloing, but I'm also curious about whether you still see room for specialization within a group. So a common meme that we see right now is, you know, somebody is looking to hire an entry-level software or engineer, and um, you know. Like, uh, entry level, but they're expected to have experience in Azure Cloud and experience uh, in four different programming languages. So, you know, it's really hard for someone who's new to come on board a team and know the full stack that can handle, you know, like you're showing up here, like platform engineering, software engineering. And so I'm wondering if you do see room for specialization on a team or if you really do see a need for when people get on a team and you know they're not de siloed or they're not siloed, <laughs> that everyone should build up that same knowledge base entirely. So let me ask a question first. 
How many of you started your career as a junior engineer? I mean, everybody started somewhere. There was a point in time when you didn't know anything about what you were doing, right? And in some ways, that's the most important thing to know, that you don't know. Uh, and not just like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. I have absolutely no idea. You know, as a senior engineer, if you're there yet, you know what I'm talking about. If you aren't there yet, don't worry, you'll find out. Um, you'll hear senior engineers saying, oh, I have no idea why, why that happened. Um, that's true, but that's not what I'm talking about. That's a you know, the self-deprecating sort of thing. Like, there's a certain point in time where you don't know all of these things that eventually you want to know. And kind of knowing that is, is in my mind, the first, the first step, right? Not just not knowing, like, I haven't even started a, a uh, you know, a computer science degree or a boot camp or something like that, and I legitimately don't know everything. But here are some specific things that I don't know. So... To specifically answer your question, yes, we can't expect everyone to know all the things that go into a, a particular piece of software. And there's naturally going to be some specialization within a team um, where someone, let's say, perhaps wrote that piece of functionality so they just know it better than anyone else. What we don't want to have happen is that is the only person who knows that piece of functionality and they never tell anyone else how it works because eventually they're going to leave the company, they're going to retire, um, they're gonna get laid off or fired because you know the people who make those decisions have absolutely no idea what your team composition is, right? And you don't want to be left in a situation where the people who now have to maintain the thing have absolutely no, like legitimately have absolutely no idea what's what's going on in, in that area. Um, so yes, you should definitely construct your team with a diverse set of backgrounds and. At some level, there should be some level of spe uh, specialization because you don't want you don't want everyone to just be mediocre at everything. That's yeah. Mm, that's, I think a good way right. To put it. Yeah. In the things that matter, and that's going to be different for every every team. You do want a specialist in that area, but by the time you're done, whatever that means, everybody should have at least a mediocre passing knowledge of all the things that go into the, the projects that you're working on. Uh, there was a question in the back. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure how to put this. I'm, I'm going to call you for this. That's OK. I'll answer but, it with um, rambling, too. So my, my think, my, what I'm thinking about is how does this relate to a situation um, such as myself? I don't want to fucking my, my current situation is to, we, we don't do development. We do. Um, integration of vendor products, which still needs all of those monitoring things, and it still needs all of the platform built. And I, 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 I can perhaps guess that one of your arguments is perhaps your vendor should have done a better job and supplied you the tooling. Um, but I don't have any influence over that. You know, I can't even get them to do sensible things, let alone you know, uh, rethink how they do their work. So how does your concept here relate to that situation? Because you know, that's, that's another part of how the business works. Right? Yeah, so I, I think it's actually kind of a similar answer to the answer I gave to his question. There are the things that matter, and those are the things that you need to, you need to focus on. So I'll use an example of actually something I was doing last night, si side project. Um, some side projects, the interesting part to me is writing the code. Right? Some side projects, the code isn't really interesting to me. I just want to see the result. So in those situations, I'll go looking for all the open source projects I possibly can, which is for a side project very similar to, you know, as a company buying, you know, off the shelf products. And then I focus on integrating them together. Right? To me, that's that's the meat of the project. Right? All the other things, no one's going to I'm going to uh, kind of draw some loose connections here, but buy your services if it's uh, better integrated. That's not a bad. That's not a good example. Um, it's an interesting question, and I agree with you. Like, I think you're onto something there, I, and I, I agree with where you're going with it. Um, Perhaps next but, year you'll have a yeah. So I, I think it's, 
while I was framing it in terms of like a, a truly software project, if it's more of an integration project, it's kind of at a, a, a slightly different level. So there's, there isn't as much software engineering. Um, and ideally, you want to minimize that as much as possible. That's, not the, that, that's where I was trying to go. Writing more code doesn't create more value. In fact, writing less code creates more value from the project. Right? You want all the things that you're integrating to be as integrable as possible with the minimum amount of code. Right? I, I would say that what, as a consumer of these things, what I would like to see is some commonality between them and some choices, because not everybody wants to do things the same way. So you need flexibility to use different tooling, um, and you need some standardization, so you, you know every organization that does that integration task doesn't do it differently, which is what's happening at the moment. So you have to like you know go out to the, what, what's out there in the open source marketplace or commercial marketplace and make some choices about what tooling you use. And then you end up with you know a bespoke combination just for your organization. You go somewhere else, yeah, I know this, I know this, but I don't know that. It's like, it needs to be a little better. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Um, something that I'm dealing with at my day job right now, I'm integrating with a, a, a well-known tool. I will avoid naming it to protect the guilty. Um, it does not have an open API, uh, open API spec. The API is well documented. It's just not open API. So I can't run, you know, the standard swagger code generators against it, which means I have to write all my own code or trust that someone else's spec that they've written, you know, some third party spec um, is, is valid for the version that I'm running. So I agree with you. That does need to get better. Uh, that's, that, that is a good idea for a future talk. But I can say for all of you, if you take one thing away from this talk that has nothing to do with the subject, if you're building an API that is meant for public consumption, please document it using a standard. I would recommend OpenAPI because it's the most widely used one. But definitely something that enables machine-to-machine -to -machine interaction with a minimum amount of code. Don't force people who are using your API to write a bunch of code just to do something simple. That's dumb. That's not helpful. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, so, as somebody who does a fair of work, I uh, spent a lot of time thinking about this question and getting interested in something kind of similar, uh, which is kind of the demarcation line between. I really strongly feel that um, developers like holistically owning their product is good. It's very good. And it's something that I want to support, encourage, educate. At the same time, I have seen this like thing, DevOps taking to a point where it's like, well, let's have developers do the operations. And you get really bad at that's not that's not what they're special at. Like that's that's not the area of specialty. And so like finding that demarcation line between like what what is the holistically owning it, but also not completely owning it. Yeah, so there are a couple different ways that I, I'll answer that question. Um, I don't know, did the microphone pick that up? Yeah, you no. think so? Okay, cool. Um, the option number one, or answer number one, is that's going to be different for every team, yeah. right? Um, for the for, uh, basically those three. That yeah, right. Depending on where you are with these three things, it's going to be different, and that's going to change, right? As the developers get more familiar with the things you're doing on the DevOps and SRE side. Uh, they might feel more enabled uh, to do some of those things. But initially, yeah, they're going to need a lot of hand-holding. Uh, the second answer I'd give is, unquestionably, you are the expert when it comes to SRE things, DevOps things. Uh, and that's, you know, that, that's a role on the team. That's not a, I, I mean, in your case, it might be a job title, right? You were the one, one of the people who raised your hand for, I'm an SRE. 
Um, but that's also your role, and that's never going to change. You're always the expert when it comes to the SRE thing. So you should expect that developers are going to come to you with questions and to learn some of the things that are going to empower them. Um, and realistically, it's it's a culture thing, right? So you just you just kind of have to feel it out. Yeah. Uh, that is, yeah, that is definitely a them problem. If they're writing JavaScript, sorry, I write JavaScript. I wrote JavaScript for a while. It's, it's a problem. <laughs> um, that, that's actually. Thank you for reminding me because I did want to include that in include some some discussion of that, um, especially when it comes to like truly operation side. Right, DevOps is not let's do development and let's do operations. It's let's find the middle ground between development and operations, right? So, and, and part of that is because software engineering is a creative process. I know it has engineering in the title. It is a creative process. We need our flow, right? We need four hours of uninterrupted time to solve a problem. If we're getting un interrupted by a bunch of operational stuff, that is going to inhibit our ability to do the development side of things. So I think the, the absolutely non-committal answer to your question is when it starts to interfere with their ability to build code, um, then, then it's too much. And they shouldn't be the only people handling the operation side of things, right? There's a, there's a reason we still have IT departments, even in large software companies. Developers are not, like, I don't know how to maintain this, how to work this thing anymore. That's why there were four of us uh, figuring out why it couldn't connect to the, the projector this morning. I don't know anymore. There was a time when I knew how to figure out how, how to connect my machine to a projector. Now, other people are experts, and I'm happy to let them be experts on that. Yeah? Isn't operations coding and development these days? It should <laughs> be. It, it is where I am. And yeah. Not exactly. Leading edge. So... That was actually another contender for title for this talk. Everything is code. All the things are code. Um, yes, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer that all of these things should be code for some definition of code. Even if you're using like a no code, low code platform, like that's still code. Um, the reason is that it's documented, it's uh, reliable, it's repeatable. Right? Documentation is not reputable, repeatable because it requires a human to interpret the documentation and then do something else. They could easily misinterpret. They could easily um, do something different from what's, what's written in the documentation. They might uh, recognize a problem before it really exists and it didn't actually exist and introduce a solution that creates <coughs> other problems down the road. Right? But everything being code, regardless of whether it's software, or infrastructure or operations um, means that it'll, it'll always happen the same way all the time. And so yeah, I, I, so where I would draw the distinction is software engineering being writing product code for, for the purposes of this talk, right? Software engineering being writing product code and then SRE, you might still be writing code, but it's a different kind of code. And QA falls into that too, right? Most QA departments these days write code. That doesn't make them not software engineers, but it also doesn't make them software engineers in the same way that uh, other software engineers are software engineers. I'm not saying that all software engineers are equal, but some software engineers are more equal than others. That's not what I'm saying. Um, but there's you know different. Everything is code. Everyone's a software engineer, but we all do slightly different things. Whether we write code is no longer the distinction of whether we're a software engineer or not. Yeah. Oh, we're going to need to wrap up pretty soon. Uh, oh, yeah. okay. I rambled for an hour. Awesome. Any other questions? I mean, I would just ask, like, did you ever hear about the no-ops 
folks and they're like, no, everything is a dev problem, everything is a, so a service or software and we won't ever need anyone to know how to operate anything. Because that was a much shorter actual fad that like went, exploded and, and compressed and like there are differences in how you do things, but there are companies that are run without anyone ever dedicated to being, you know, intentionally ops, intentionally platform, intentionally SRE, intentionally yeah. sysadmin. Yeah, so, uh, yes, the words no, never, always, those are dangerous and probably wrong. Um, there's always going to be an exception. Uh, no ops as a idea philosophy mm, might be kind of cool. It might be a good uh, challenge, thought experiment, right? How much can we do without having a traditional ops department? But at a certain point in time, you're going to encounter situations that require someone to take on the ops mantle, right? Same, same thing as your question, right? If you get big enough, you just can't have your software engineering teams do all the operations because it's going to interrupt them from doing things that aren't operations, right? And it's a balance, question of scale, yeah, that sort of thing. Cool? We all feel good about that? All right, thank you all. <laughs>